Hi, I'm Dan McDonald, along with uh, Peter Berenz and Ian Ford. I am giving the talk, Automated Planar Geometry. We'll be revealing some new features from uh, the Synthetic Geometry Project for Mathematica version 12.1. Um, included in those changes the, uh, uh, will be a dynamic version of geometric scene where uh, points can be manipulated. We'll also be uh, introducing automated uh, geometric theorem proving functionality. Uh, and we'll also introduce uh, an entity property table with um, curated geometric theorems uh, from the past to the present. Hello, Champagne. Um, we are the uh, uh, synthetic geometry team at Wolfram. Uh, I am uh, Daniel. Uh, also speaking today will be Peter and Ian. And then also on the team are Lynn Douglas, uh, Michael Trott, James Muldix, um, our intern, Zhao Fan, and uh, we are mostly based here in Champaign. Right, so kind of an overview of the project. This is, um, you know, we've been giving similar talks the past couple of years, but uh, we've got some uh, improvements for coming for 12.1. So anyways, um, our uh, functionality includes uh, geometric scene, which is used for describing abstract uh, uh, coordinate-free scenes in two-dimensional geometry. Um, and so for version 12.1, uh, we are adding capabilities for uh, constructions and also for uh, interactivity. So we, once we uh, you know, have a scene, we should be able to manipulate the points. Um, We've also ex expanded the scope of uh, statements we are allowing. Uh, why is this not going down? Um, why did this go down? Okay, um, we also have, so we describe a scene, we wanna be able to draw it. So, um, so that's our function random instance, which, uh, which will act on geometric scene um, and once we've drawn a scene, we want to be able to make conjectures about the scene using the, uh, the coordinate information we have from, uh, uh, from the picture provided by a random instance. So that's fine geometric conjectures. And then uh, finally, well, not, not finally apparently, uh, we want to be able to prove theorems about the scene. So that's, uh, that's going to be the function find geometric proof. Uh, this function was not available in 12.0, but should be available in 12.1. And these are human readable synthetic proofs, so something that, uh, that a high schooler should be able to understand. Um, and then we've also, oops, um, what, yeah, the scrolling's not working. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, what is he saying? It's just highlighting. Um, and then uh, we've also uh, introduced uh, um, an entity, uh, uh, entity uh, property table uh, that contains curated scenes from uh, classical geometry, uh, a lot of Euclid, but uh, some, some more recent stuff. Well, recent in the, as in the last few centuries. Um, let's go next. Okay, so uh, in our group, we always uh, start with uh, Thales' theorem for our example. So, uh, right, so we're just going to dive into uh, to, uh, some examples of uh, um, how our functionality works. So Thales' theorem says, let A, B, and C be distinct points on a circle and line AC is a diameter, then the angle ABC is a right angle. So using geometric scene, how would we describe this? Um, we've got uh, point A, B, and C, and then a, a center O. So we have a circle through ABC centered at O. 
we want to draw the triangle ABC, and we want O to be the, the midpoint of A and C. So notice we don't mention uh, the conclusion here, but um, rather we hope that it uh, ends up looking that way, and it seems like it does. Ah. It's scrolling, it's not working. Okay, there we go. There we go. I am a P PC person. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I'm pressing too hard. Um, just a, a Winnie from Mice and Men problem here, I guess. Um, right. So uh, we uh, so we draw the picture, and we notice that uh, now uh, this uh, picture is interactive. So say we've got this point B. Uh, and we, for some reason, don't like it here. We want it here. We can drag, and we've got a little ghost of it, and it moves. So uh, notice that the, the picture kind of changed. That's because we didn't necessarily fix A, O, and C. So if we don't want the picture like that to change, then we can make, uh, make some of the other points anchors. Uh, and now if I move B around, um, a and uh, yeah, the rest of the picture stays the same. Um, let's, there we go. Right. So uh, I also want to point out that um, uh, that there's no, there doesn't have to be a, a unique way for you to describe the scene. So this should describe, you know, describe Bailey's theorem as well. Say so we've got uh, the circum. Oops. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, the circumcenter of, uh, of triangle ABC uh, is the midpoint of AC, fully describes uh, uh, Thales' theorem, and we, uh, we get a picture. So I'll also point out that since this is a random instance we're running, um, if we run it again, we'll get uh, a different picture. Oops. Uh, let's run it one more time. Uh, wait, I'm apparently not running it. Here we go. Right, there we go. Get a different picture. Uh, and again, uh, if we like, we can uh, drag things around. Okay? Right, so, um, you know, the, this, you know, the formatting is a, as a dynamic module with a, with a graphics image, but the, uh, the input form is still a uh, geometric scene, and it has you know, all the data about uh, all our coordinates and such, um, which can be extracted later if desired. Right, so uh, we have our, our scene drawn. We want to make conjectures about it, so we can uh, run find geometric conjectures. And we see how that formats. So, um, so we've got some highlighting. So here our, con our conclusion is uh, that line BA and line DC are perpendicular, and these are highlighted. Um, there are a few equivalent ones here. Uh, planar angle ABC equals 90 degrees. So these are both the conclusions of, uh, of Thales' theorem. Uh, right. Um, oh, one other thing I want to point out is um, if you want to move multiple points at once, um, you can click pause updates, uh, and that means that say I want to move A around, and I also want to move C around at the same time without it trying to, uh, to draw the picture, and then it's like, okay, this looks good. Now I want to unpause, um, and it moves them around. Okay, so right. And then uh, finally for finding the conclusions, um, we, uh, you know, we have it, uh, we can have, it will uh, default to formatting as a geometric scene, but if we want to just uh, um, extract the conclusions directly, uh, we can use a subvalue, uh, and here we're also searching for a specific uh, type of conclusion, and we get planar angle of ABC equals 90 degrees, as, uh, as Thales guaranteed it would. Um, okay, so let's do a couple more examples. So here's uh, Paps's hexagon theorem. 
So we've got uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, two sets of collinear points. Um, and then it says uh, that these intersection points X, Y, and Z should also be collinear. Um, so anyways, let's uh, run a uh, uh, random instance on this. And we draw a picture. Good. So um, again, so let's say we, we want to move a point around. So let's see, we move E around. Maybe we want to um, fix C and A and then move B around. Okay, so we've, you know, we, we, uh, we fix C and A, we move B around, everything else moves, so maybe we uh, want to zoom, uh, zoom out a bit so we can see the picture better. Um, oops, go this way. Uh, and say we like this better than, uh, than our original picture, uh, we can uh, paste this as a, as a graphics if we'd like. Um, we can also paste this as a geometric scene. And that'll be down here, right? And then if we decide that, uh, no, we like the original better because our functionality knows best, we can go back to the uh, initial settings. And then finally, just to confirm, our uh, find geometric conjectures does in fact find that uh, X, Y, and Z are collinear. Right. So Cosnita's theorem uh, has to do with uh, circles apparently. So ABC is an arbitrary triangle, O is its circumcenter, and we've got uh, circumcenters of the three triangles. Then it says that the, uh, the straight lines between the corners of our triangle and the circumcenters are all concurrent, so they all meet at this point uh, uh, K here in this picture. So uh, notice that we have a random seeding option for random instance. So this is if you want to be able to repeat your uh, um, repeat your out output, uh, you can use random seeding, and it's good for for talks because sometimes the pictures aren't good. Uh, but I am a coward, and I want to make sure that this is a good picture. So um, holy cow, it happened to work. Um, so right, so if I run this again with the random seeding, I get the same picture. Um, and again, if I, uh, uh, scroll down. Um, if I want to move, uh, move things a bit around, you know, we noticed that uh, A, B, and C were, were uh, our original givens that were arbitrary, so maybe let's, um, Let's fix B and C, move A around a bit. And notice this is kind of a complicated uh, uh, setup, but we can still move things around and it automatically updates very quickly. Um, and uh, so that um, it doesn't require the, uh, uh, the input to be any sort of direct construction. These can all be implicit um, implicit constraints, but we will still be able to update, right? And then uh, if we run uh, find geometric conjectures on this, we notice that uh, we do find that uh, these infinite lines are all concurrent. So this will help uh, Kuznita sleep well at night in his, in his grave, apparently, probably. There, if you've got a geometry theorem named after you, you're probably dead. Uh, Yeah. Um, okay. So these were kind of classical theorems for geometry. Um, you know, we also deal with uh, more high school-like problems. Um, so here, say we've got a, a scene with with four tangent circles, and the largest three of the circles have these given radii, and we want to uh, um, we want to find the radius of the fourth circle. So we can run random instance to, uh, oops, um, oh, good, um, to uh, find the scene. So here we've got uh, 
uh, A, B, and C are big circles and uh, are the centers of our big circles and, and D is the center of our smaller circle. And if we uh, zoom in, we can see that uh, there's actually a circle around D. And then if we want to actually solve for the radius of the, of the fourth circle, um, we notice that we had named it uh, rad. So here we have uh, um, the radii of our, the given radii, and then we're solving for this variable rad and uh, the circle centered at D. Um, and so if we uh, extract the quantity subvalue from this geometric scene, uh, it will be a list of rules and uh, we can uh, replace rad with uh, whatever rad gets sent to, which it turns out is 21. So these uh, large values were not so random because we wanted to, to get an integer um, output apparently. Right. Um, so finally, one, uh, uh, one other new thing uh, in 12.1 for, uh, for random instance and geometric scene is that we now explicitly export, uh, su explicitly support constructions. So let's uh, go back to Euclid, who I am pretty sure actually is dead. Um, so proposition one of book one of Euclid states that given any two points A and B, one can construct an equilateral triangle having A and B as two of its vertices. Um, I hope you believe that. Uh, and so the, if you don't believe that, um, the construction is to draw two circles centered at A and B, whose radii are equal to the distance between them, then their point of intersection forms a third vertex of an equilateral triangle. So if we just wanted to draw the scene without thinking of it as a construction, we could uh, do it uh, like this. Um, so circle through of BC centered at A, circle through of AC centered at B, and then triangle um, ABC. Right. Uh, so this gives us the picture, but this wasn't really the construction that, uh, that Euclid had in mind. So if we wanted to do this step by step, we could uh, do it like this. So notice that the argument structure here is the second argument. Uh, instead of just being a, a vector of hypotheses, it's now uh, a matrix. It's a, it's a list of lists of construction steps. So the first construction step, we say, OK, we have two points A and B, distance D apart. Uh, the second construction set step is, OK, well, now we draw um, circles centered at each point of radius D. Uh, the third construction step is we, we pick this point C that's in both circles. And then finally, we draw this triangle um, ABC. Right. And then we get a similar picture, but we have a better idea of how we got there. So that was a simple example. Uh, Euclid does get a little, uh, a little more advanced as you go on. So Proposition 22 actually generalizes what we just did, stating that for any positive quantities R, S, and T, such that uh, neither S nor T is uh, larger than R and R is less than S and T, there is a triangle having side lengths R, S, and T. So this is... Uh, um, this should also be obvious, but if it's not, we'll uh, show you how it's done. So uh, for us, let's randomly choose uh, positive quantities R, S, and T, satisfying all this. So we'll pick um, S and T, and then we'll pick R. And then our construction goes like this. So we've got a straight line through the points D, F, G, and H in order. So the, here we've got line D, F, G, H. So inside of geometric scene, uh, lines are all assumed to be straight. So you know, outside of geometric scene, these, this could be a, a jagged line. But inside, we're assuming that uh, there's an assumption that this will be straight. Um, and then we've got distances uh, uh, R, S, and T for how far these points are apart. Um, then we want to draw the circle centered at F going through D. So we've got circle through uh, uh, D comma K at F because we are going to have K as one of the points where these two circles intersect. So we've got circle through D, 
D and K centered at F and circled through K and H centered at G. Um, uh, let's see, and then finally, uh, we will want to draw the triangle uh, F uh, um, with vertices at F, G, and K, right? Because if K is one of the points where these circles intersect and F is distance R from K, F is distance S from G, and G is distance D from K, then the points F, G, and K form the triangle we want. So if we we'll run this from this construction, um, might take a while to actually run that. Uh, I can't tell if this is running. Let's try this again. There we go. Um, we had uh, kind of, I guess, weird, uh, weird value, weird random values, but we do get the uh, to get the picture. So let's do this again with some uh, less extreme values. There, that should be better. Now let's run this again. There we go. So we. Uh, have our two circles uh, in our triangle, and it uh, satisfies Euclid's um, conclusion. Okay, so that is the new stuff with uh, random instance and geometric scene, and now Peter's going to talk about his, uh, his project, which has been uh, the automated theorem prover. So I feel really lucky to be able to work on this project. It's been really fun to work on. And uh, so let me describe it for a second. Um, we're going to be proving, um, we're going to be creating synthetic geometric proofs, but maybe not of a, it, it's actually sort of a unique um, function. Um, we wanted to have something that could really be helpful for high school students, as well as hopefully be um, interesting for professionals and others. So, and something that could be potentially used in Wolfram Alpha, and importantly for high school students to output a proof that students can understand, and actually even the proof that they expect to see. Um, so what we did is we created something that I, I'm just calling a naive prover, um, rather than start with some of the axiomatizations that have been uh, implemented before in systems like Koch, um, uh, or there's something called the area method, which uh, can, can do synthetic geometry, but they, uh, they don't really uh, produce that great, that very, uh, that human readable of a proof. Um, so what I've done here is we, we have a proof system that actually works internally the way that a high school student or a, a Euclidean geometer would um, go about proving stuff. So some of the drawbacks are it doesn't handle degeneracy easily. We have to have sort of special cases for that. Um, but that's also true in, in the ninth grade classroom. Sometimes that's sort of swept under the rug. Um, and there's, we, it's, it's still evolving, but it's, it's not clear at any point where uh, what the, uh, the total theory of, the, of this uh, system is. But the advantages are we have a, a nice control over what kinds of things we can prove. And so that's great because we wanted to be able to prove this, the high school stuff first. Um, we don't need to translate into readable proofs because it does that internally. Um, and the proofs are very similar, as I said. So um, the, we, there's a precursor to this fine geometric proof, which is fine equational proof, which came out in the previous version. Um, so here's an example of uh, find equational proof can prove things in, uh, well, it will be able to prove things in first order logic, um, all, any first order logic statement actually. Um, and some of the props, so you get out this proof object and some of the properties that you can query from it are a proof notebook, which in the case of find equational proof looks like this. So fairly readable and also a proof graph which is really nice to help you understand the flow of the, the arguments, um, which has some nice sort of interactivity and, uh, and dynamic stuff. So let's get to a basic example. Um, this is a really simple one-step high school problem where I just have uh, some P 
par a pair of parallel lines and one angle. So I'll run that and let's do the random instance and I have one that looked nice, not too big. So we're given this angle and let's say we want to find um, this other angle, uh, WZX, so WZX, so this angle right here. We want to show that it's equal to 150 degrees. So like find equational proof, the first argument of find geometric proof is the thing you want to prove. And then the second argument is the hypotheses. And then the, the axioms or the geometric theorems that we're familiar with are in the background. So if I run this, I get a proof object. So let's look at some of the, all the properties that exist so far. Not all of these are going to be in the final version, um, but I'm gonna show you some of the, the possibilities. So they have all the ones that are included in find equational proof as well as some others. So um, first we can show the proof data set, which is just an association um, which is wrapped in data sets. So it could easily show the, the two axioms and the lemma, and if you, you know, move through the data set, you can get the explanation as well. So the, uh, the best way to see this is probably the, what we call the proof notebook, or what's called in ninth grade geometry a two-column proof, where you have statements and reasons. So here we just have one step, really, besides the givens, and you have the explanation that because they're parallel lines, the supplement, the uh, angle, actually I forget what this theorem is called, but the, the angle on the other side of a transverse of two parallel lines is, is supplementary. Um, we can get the result itself in the Wolfram language, um, in our synthetic geometry language, and we can get a proof graph. And note, all these are um, styling to be determined, so uh, some of these things are maybe not the, the best styling, but we, we have a, this node up here is given just to make it a nice, uh, have one source and one sink. So the things that it points to are the two givens, and then this is the conclusion. And I'll show some more of this later, but if you hover over the, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, these are probably too small to see that the, the zoom doesn't affect this, but it, it shows you the, uh, the hypotheses and the conclusion, if I click on it, it, it highlights that step. So this is really a hypergraph because these two edges are sort of associated with one, each other, uh, one another. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit harder one. So here I have three lines that are tangent to the outside of a circle, and I've, I've been given some of the lengths. So let's show a random instance of that, okay. So it doesn't actually show the lengths here, unfortunately, but um, we have, so this one right here we're given, and some other ones, this, uh, the complete one right there. Um, so now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use the, the one argument form of fine geometric proof, which tries to find all, or as many as possible in, the given, in, in a given uh, time limit or number of steps, which are options um, all the sort of the interesting proofs. And you can also, uh, you can also determine the number, uh, the depth of an expression that you'd want to come out. So you can, you don't want to have, you know, really complicated expressions about a really simple diagram. Uh, so let's see what it, what it comes up with. So it comes up with a proof in 16 steps. And the notebook is still a two column proof. It still has a, a last, element, but this is no longer the conclusion necessarily. All these steps in between, some of them don't have, aren't necessary for other things, some of them are. So it's a graph without a, a single sink. Um, so it manages to prove all the other distances and even find the area using uh, Heron's formula. Okay. So here's a, an even harder example. Um, this is one that involves some construction. Uh, maybe not necessarily, but in, in the usual way, we'll find some construction. So we're asked to find the area of the given shape. You'll notice there's a sort of implied rectangle there that would help us find the given shape. So let's, uh, 
enter the scene. I guess I don't need to do a random instance since I have the image. So uh, this is something new as well that we um, are still figuring out exactly how it's going to work. But notice I have a pattern here because I don't know what the area is yet. And I've described the, the area of a polygon in terms of uh, formal D, formal B, B, C, D. So that's, um, so this is B, C, D, and then D, I should have done the random instance. Maybe I'll do that. Let's, hopefully this works. Oh, well, I'm not sure what went wrong there. Anyway, um, so let's let's run this uh, proof here. See what happens. Or oh, this one takes a little longer, actually. Maybe I shouldn't have run it, but uh, you'll notice I get the result out. Um, and notice that the, the area is actually um, a different area. It's been cyclically permuted. The uh, the vertices. So it's able to figure that out. It's able to figure out that if it finds an area of a different, an equivalent area of a different polygon, um, the same polygon expressed differently, it'll still find it. So here's the notebook. It's quite, oops, I should have just done this. Uh, so notice we do um, construct a point here. It's unfortunately named P sub EJX at this point. And that um, w one interesting thing about this is this point actually contains within itself its own definition. So that's helpful for using it in a next, um, a next step. So we do construct this point because we see two pairs of parallel lines and we say, oh, we should, that's a parallelogram. We should define the fourth point. Probably that's going to be useful. And the whole question of whether, when to define new points is um, is a really tricky one, but if we look at the, the proof graph here, you see it, it uh, ends up finding the, the 270 area, and I can look at you know, where each of these um, steps comes from. Now, another interesting thing you can do is you can actually trim a, um, a, a, a geometric proof to target a specific thing. So if we noticed in this proof that, oh, we're constructing a point, <clears throat> uh, that makes a parallelogram. I wonder what the area of that par parallelogram is. We can, well, let, we could first uh, run the proof with just one argument, and then we get a big, uh, big old proof graph that looks like this. So notice it doesn't have any endpoints. It just, it basically uh, ran out of time at, at the one, two, three, four, fifth iteration. Happens to be coincidence after five seconds. Um, and now what we can do is we can, and now this is a little hacky right now because I said we haven't figured out exactly how this is going to work, but I'm looking for a point which is not one of the points that we're given. Okay, so it actually has this wrapper right now, constructed geometric point, but um, what we get here is a trimmed or pruned version of the, of the proof that this uh, parallelogram rectangle really is, uh, is, has area 300. So this is the trimmed proof graph. And I, I could also say that uh, it has some nice dynamic functionality here where we can label the vertices. Um, we ha I showed you the tool tips. We can have indices um, to label that, that match the indices of the proof uh, notebook or the two-column proof. And we might have something called augmented scene, which could put back the conclusions into a geometric scene and even better to actually show the construction steps as separate steps of the geometric scene. So that would be nice. Um, although if you think about that, there's some tricky issues there. Sometimes a step is not really different in, in uh, visually. Okay, so now I'll do two more um, sort of more advanced things that we can do. So one interesting thing we can do is find the golden ratio. So here's a scene and, and the, the main thing to see in, in this uh, the, the golden rectangle setup here is that we have two similar rectangles, um, and that one side is is the one side is shared. Okay, and I'm actually given this kind of helps the proof along. Uh, you can to give one um, length. So the actually it's going to find one over the golden ratio. So 
I'll show you this. It takes 30 seconds, so I'll just show you um, the notebook. So it's the pruning maybe could be a little bit better, but in the end it does. Uh, so the problem with the pruning in this case is that um, at some point we throw it all into uh, all these facts into reduce. Um, this, this did work better at some point, but um, so that's why it doesn't get pruned so well um, because some of these facts are actually irrelevant to be thrown into reduce. Um, we are working on a uh, a way to reduce the inputs to reduce um, to uh, to find the the minimal set of endpoints that that proves this this fact. So we can find the golden ratio, which is cool. And oops, oh, that was okay. Now um, I'm going to prove Thales' theorem. Although eventually Thales' theorem might be a theorem that we include in the the sort of axioms of this system, but I left it out for now because it's cool to prove. So let's, we, we, we've seen the random instance before, and sometimes it helps the prover along to, to name things, or as I did before, to, to give them a, a, um, a distance. Uh, because, uh, again, the reason for that is we, um, we don't want to prove too many things about things that, that the user didn't mention, right? So it helps to mention things, and then the, the prover will prove more stuff about it. So if you can see, we're, we're looking for the angle CBA, or it could be ABC. Um, and it, it finds the proof in, uh, well, too many steps in this case. But um, again, we have the, um, we have a way to, to shrink this, but we do have, we do find out that the angle ABC is equal to 90 degrees. Um, I think that's it. Okay. so. Yeah, so notice we're, we're using reduce here. Um, okay, and so my last example is sort of a classic problem um, where you have a, a sort of bicycle chain and you want to figure out the distance between the two, the two gears. And one of the steps here is to, is to find, is to, one of the steps in the classic proof is to, is to define this point E which makes a rectangle and then allows you to find various uh, distances, like the one from C to K is the one you want. Um, so it helps if we add that point E, and then we can ask for the distance from C to K, and then we get um, a proof of that square root of 941. And we can look at the proof graph of that if we want. Um, and so, um, we're still working on this, but again, it's, it should be out in an experimental version at 12.1, and i um, really excited. So <laughs> next we're going to talk about, uh, Ian's going to talk about some curated scenes. Can you hear me? All right. So I'm going to talk about some a uh, project that we've been working on to curate lots and lots of these geometric scenes. It can be a little tricky and it, it takes some care to write these things. It could help to have lots of examples to look at. Also, this can serve as a useful reference. Um, so far, we've got about uh, 260, approaching 300 uh, famous geometric scenes. Um, these come from Euclid's Elements and Math World and other sources, right? And so these are all going to be accessible through the Wolfram knowledge base. Your main entry point to that is going to be this function entity value. So if you want, say, a count of how many entities we have, you would just use entity value. Uh, the domain is geometric scenes. And you, you see we've currently got 261 at the time that I wrote these slides. Right? Now each scene is going to be represented as what's called an entity. So. Here are what entities look like. So using entity value, you can get a list of all the entities. So you can see lots of these kind of elementary lemmas that get used all the time in, say, high school geometry proofs. We've got more classical theorems, like Seva's theorem, Brett Schneider's formula, right, and just a ton of Euclid. We've currently got, I think, all of the 2D plane geometry, for the most part, from Euclid's elements. Right, and so this is 
just another way of showing you can get random entities. You can also just use the function random entity and explore through them that way. Right? Now, like I said, some of these entities came from Euclid's Elements, some came from Math World, and lots of other places. So another useful thing that we do in the Wolfram Knowledge Base is to sort entities into entity classes. Um, this is a pre-release version that I'm dealing with. So these are just a few of the entity classes that we've got right now. We'll be able to categorize these more uh, as we work on this. So we take the entity class representing all of Euclid's elements and ask for the entities that are in that with entity value. We get that list. Now, what do you do with entities? Associated with any entity are a list of properties about that entity, right? This is any entity in the Wolfram Knowledge Base. Um, each different domain has different properties it supports. And so for the geometric scene domain, we've got lots of things from, you know, bibliographic information, like where did we get this information? Who proved this? Who is this theorem named after, right? The real, uh, key thing here, the main property we want to look at is the scene property, which returns the geometric scene object that uh, Dan and Peter have been showing we can work with. So we saw Thales' theorem earlier. We've got Thales' theorem, right? So if you take Thales' theorem and you ask for the scene, then this is one way of representing Thales' theorem as a geometric scene that we've got curated. And of course, you can do all of the things you can do with a geometric scene, you can do with these scenes from the uh, geometric scene domain. You can find instances, you can find conjectures. Um, try find geometric proof. Maybe we can prove some of those, right? Um, like Dan showed, we have oftentimes there's more than one way to represent a given scene. Um, we try to just choose kind of one of the cleaner ways, but if there's legitimately multiple different, like stylistically nice ways to represent the scene, sometimes we curate these alternate scenes. So for example, the angle, angle, angle theorem, we've got, I guess, one alternate scene aside from the regular scene property, which is kind of the canonical one, right? Along with these, we've got some natural language statements of what these scenes are. Right, in the case of theorems, this would be like a theorem statement. So Desargues theorem, right, you can see that. And there are alternate statements. So Desargues theorem is about perspective geometry and there's lots of different terminology you can use to essentially say the same thing with Desargues theorem. Right, like I said, we've also got lots of um, bibliographical and historical information on these things. So for example, we can say who formulated this theorem. That might not always be the same thing as who proved the theorem, right? So in the case of the draws farney theorem, looks like Arnold draws farney formulated it in 1899, right? But there is, this was a problem that he posed that wasn't solved until later, which was to find the proof of that theorem. And this was uh, proved by this person. I won't try to <laughs> pronounce that. Apologies. And of course, sometimes they're named after somebody, right? And in this case, it's named after the person who posed the problem, uh, Draws Farney, right? These also interlink with other pieces of the Wolfram knowledge base, right? So there is a Math World article about the Finsler Hadwiger theorem, about the Draws Farney theorem, about lots of these, right? And you can access, access those directly through entity value as well using the Math World property. This will give you a list of the entities representing pages on Math World that you can go and look at. Right, and also we can look at the Wolfram Demonstrations Project. A lot of these also, a lot of these famous theorems are on there, and you can get related demonstrations, and then using those, you know, get the interactive manipulates from the Demonstrations Project and play with that. Right, so we're 
working on pushing this out to everybody. We've also got future plans to expose this on Wolfram Alpha, and that is in the works. So you'll be able to just go to the Wolfram Alpha site and ask about these things, and we hope it's useful. And thank you for listening to our talk. <laughs>